This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Game 7, classic, in the garden. Celtics win, they move on. The league is now set in the Eastern Conference. Celtics versus the Cavs, two best teams in the Eastern Conference. We are excited to break it down. Also, so much to discuss, not only with that game, but also previewing this epic matchup. The King, can he continue this run, impressive run, where, I mean, the man is just all world right now. Can the Celtics knock him off? I mean, it's kind of like David and Goliath in reverse. So, so much to get into, man. Let me roll out the red carpet to my right-hand man, 50 grand NBA aficionado, my brother from another mother, reps www.shawsports.net, Big Kahuna PNC. Mr. Warren Shaw repping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holler back at me, Mr. Shaw. Were you watching this game from wire to wire? Uh, from wire to wire, brother. You know, and it was it was a doozy. It lived up to everything a game seven should. A lot of drama, a lot of heartbreaking moments. Guys coming out of the damn booby trap, if you will, and setting things up, especially well for the Boston Celtics, if you're on that side of things, man. It was a great game. But salute, salute to all the fans listeners of NBA Baseline. I know we got some great love on our game seven preview predictions. You ended up being right, although you weren't 100% confident with your predict. I was wrong. The Wizards were not able to get it done on the road here. Um, but again, it was a great series, man. Two great teams that should be having, might have a little budding rivalry going moving forward, bro. Yeah, definitely. And before we actually get to the crux of our show in in a in a you know in a little bit, we're gonna start talking about you know the preview uh, this coming Wednesday between the uh, game one uh, of the Eastern Conference Finals. We're talking about the. Boston Celtics and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, and then a little bit later on in the show, we'll do our going on and get, we, you know, basically talk about this epic run by the Washington Wizards to basically be one game shy of putting themselves in a position to play in the Eastern Conference Finals. I want to touch back on this, this, this game seven show. I think we'd be, it'd be, we'd be remiss if we didn't really talk about this game. And this is not just about, you know, myself or you and being Boston Celtics fans. Everything that we had talked about in our preview is exactly what we felt was necessary to get the kind of quality game seven that we that we just witnessed. I mean, this wasn't just about John Wall versus Isaiah Thomas, and it wasn't just about Bradley Beal. It was about the other players stepping up. You saw contributions from different guys at different points in the game, and it kept the game close. It wasn't like the game five blowout where it just the, the wheels fell off the hinges early and often for a team like the Wizards. This team was coming off of a dramatic game six win, Shaw, and we talked about this, and we said, will they carry this momentum into game seven? And realistically, for three quarters, the Washington Wizards basically had the Boston Celtics on the ropes. Brad Stevens figuring out ways to keep his team in it, getting contributions from a variety of different guys. And this is what made this game so compelling because it basically took the fourth quarter and some uncanny play for some role players that we probably didn't even think were going to step up big in this game. They stepped up and they did it for the Celtics to get them to move on. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's great that we could kind of point out the keys to a game and those really were what ended up coming to fruition. 45 to 5. That is the number of Celtics bench points compared to the Wizards bench points. And we were concerned. And it wasn't it wasn't Avery Bradley, you know, who was the 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 but Robin. Did, we, Tajay did, did, did I not say, Shaw, did I not say that it was going to take a Herculean effort by Isaiah Thomas, but one that wasn't depicting of him having to score 45 or 50 points for this team to win? The 12 assists stand out so much for me because a lot of that was basically the smart decision making and the dribble drive penetration of Isaiah Thomas and kicking it to the open guys and relying that they were going to hit their shots, and they did that. Right, and a lot of it, too, is like if you listen to the uh, the presser, Brad Stevens said, you know, in terms of the trap, because Washington did try to go to that. They tried to trap Isaiah, um, you know, especially in, in late in the third and in the fourth quarter when things looked like they were starting to get away from them. Um, and all he said is, like, he moved his horns play up a little bit, just moved it 10 feet up so that Isaiah would have more room to operate, you know, in kind of in the open space of the, of, of the half court, if you will. And all that made the difference. And, you know, and having guys, having shooters surrounded him um, and then being able to make those shots were huge, too. But, I mean, there's so many aspects of this game. And I know we had to get to our conference finals preview and everything like that, too. But even when they took IT out in the third quarter and it was it was that group of Marcus Smart and Jalen Brown, those guys were out there. And, again, I've 
I've buried Marcus Smart twice over in this series. Um, but they don't win this game without his play defensively this evening and a couple of nice offensive layups and things of that nature as well, too. Uh, he, he was phenomenal, although Beal was still giving him the business and giving him that work. Uh, he has some key, huge defensive plays and cost some turnovers that really stemmed the tide for the Celtics. Oh, talking about um, players giving the business and putting in that work. How about Kelly O'Linick or my new nickname for this dude after this Game 7 performance, Kelly O'Clinic? Because that's exactly what he did against the Washington Wizards. He put on a clinic of basically playing big man ball and stretching that floor. I mean, he basically abused Markeith Morris, Marcin Gortat, and Otto Porter Jr. They had no answer for Kelly Olenek. I mean, you know, whether or not he's shooting a three, he got it in off and early. And then, that you remember that one play where he faked the uh, the, the, the hand around to Isaiah Thomas and just basically... Uh, he's good for that. Oop, oop, oopsie dude. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 who was it? Markeith Morris. On the on the and one play, I mean, absolutely. But that to me, Shaw, is confidence. That to me is believing that you know that you can bring something to the table in a must win situation. And that is exactly what we were looking for. Who was going to step up and be it's Robin? And it was Kelly Olynyk tonight, man. I know Marcus Smart a lot. Of, even Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown was. Crazy hustle points, man. Like you said, we can go on and on and on about how great this game was because it wasn't just about the statistics. It was about the key runs and the key plays at critical moments because if you watch this game, you really couldn't tell who was the more dominant team. It just looked like it was a matter of who was going to make that key run. The Celtics go on an 11-0 run at the end of that third quarter and really set the table to put themselves in the best position possible to take that fourth quarter. And it was going to take a Herculean effort on the other side for the Wizards meaning Bradley Beal, John Wall would have had to replicate what they did in game six and the Boston Celtics knew if they clamped down on them, they put the onus back on the rest of the role players and those guys just couldn't come through. They couldn't they couldn't maintain what they did that previous game to figure out a way to do it on the road against the Boston Celtics. At the end of the day, you have to think that the, the Wizards ran out of gas. Listen, 46 minutes for Beal, 44 minutes for, for Wall, 39 for Porter, 42 for Marcus Morris. 33 for Gortat. I mean, again, for those five starters, you know, at 40 minutes, roughly, you know, give or take the one minute from Otto Porter at 39, like that's, that's madness. They ran, they ran out of gas. And as much as, as much as this Wizards team is, is a good basketball team, it goes back to them just not having enough bench uh, players to really to come in there and step up. And Scott Brooks not having the faith in them. They asked him why Kelly Oubre didn't get off the floor. Um, he just said, I wanted to go with the guys that give us the best chance to win. And that's something we talked about even our game seven preview. A little bit. It's like, okay, well, who's going to be out there and what's going to happen? And Scott Brooks was like, it's my starters. While Brad Stevens was like, all right, well, it's going to be our, our 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 committee of merry men. You know, went went really nine deep. You know, you're not really count Rozier's four minutes. So he said he went eight deep. But Jalen Brown played 20 big minutes off the bench. Kelly Olynyk obviously 26 points in 28 minutes. And Marcus Smart, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, didn't have a turnover. You know, four of seven from yeah. the floor, uh, 13 points, six rebounds, four assists, two steals, no turnovers, plus 14. Um, and the Celtics won this game by 10 points. So, you know, again, Marcus Smart and Kelly Olenek were, were, were massive in this. And before we move on, just real quick for you, I want to ask you this, because I know what side of the fence I'm on it with right now. But John Wall goes, what was it, 0 for 10, you know, in, in the final stretch of this game here. And, you know, I was unable to hit a basket. I think he went 0 for 7 from the three-point line as well. Uh, does this knock him down a notch from all the great progress he's made in this year's playoffs, does does he now go back to being just all star, wall star, as opposed to being an elite point guard in the Eastern Conference or in the NBA? It, no, I don't think so. Um, good, and good, and, and the reason why the reason why I say that is because it basically took this, um, what he's done through the course of this series for us to even have him in this conversation, um, and and ultimately he was showing you exactly what kind of John Wall the Celtics didn't want to see in this Game Seven. Because that was what it, that's basically what the Wizards had going for them to give them the lead that they had midway into the third quarter of this game. So I, I, I you know, I can't fault John Wall for coming up short. This is not by like I don't want people making these comparisons about what John Wall didn't do in the fourth quarter in comparison to what John James Harden didn't do at all. That's not even close. It, 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 you see what I'm saying? But people will do that when we start speculating about superstars and they don't look you know, really at, at the way that guys were playing through the course of a game. They just look at the numbers. So, again, you look at the numbers and you say to yourself, man, was it enough for John Wall? And you said it earlier to your point, they may have ran out of gas. I think, though, at the same time, a lot of it comes down to maturation and execution. 
Whereas what we applaud Isaiah Thomas for doing when he doesn't have it, he put it on his other guy's shoulders to come through. Whereas with John Wall, you really began to question, can he rely on anyone other than Bradley Beal to make shots or to make the smart play? And in actuality, he kind of did that. There was a couple of key moments where Markeith Morris had hit some key threes because of John Wall's penetration and kickouts. So I applaud John Wall because he did do the things necessary when he just didn't have it going until he could try and refine his mojo. But again, I don't think it should be uh, it should be an indictment that he fell short in the in the fourth quarter, had a horrific fourth quarter. There's no question about it. Uh, but I think that that is signs of someone who is going to be on the come up and his, his he should be he should maintain his status quo for what he helped the Wizards do to this point. Now, real quick, Shaw, because I know we got to get into this preview. But it's really interesting because we were talking about, you know, you were trying to listen for a lot of analysis and people's perspectives with regards to this game. I found it interesting that Charles Barkley had put emphasis that he wanted to put some blame on Scott Brooks for not playing his bench. He thought that maybe Scott Brooks should have played his bench more. And I actually feel just the opposite. I actually applaud Scott Brooks for basically saying I'm rolling with my team. There was an interesting statistic that was thrown up on TNT when John Wall and Bradley Beal are on the floor for the Washington Wizards. They are in their plus minus a plus 66. When they're off the floor, they're a minus 68, okay? You're playing in a game seven situation. I know at some point you gotta give the dude a spell. He tried to do it when the, when the Wizards had momentum and had the lead, but the moment that he came off the floor and he tried relying on guys like, you know, Jennings and Bojanovic and all those dudes, they did absolutely nothing to help the Wizards. And I, and you know, a lot of people might wanna look at this and say, hey, this is Scott Brooks. I actually applaud Scott Brooks because this was the one thing that he didn't do at times. He usually acquiesced to the superstars when he was the coach in OKC. And rather than just going for broke and going with the guys that you know are going to try and take you to the promised land, he usually tried to overanalyze and overthink the way that he should play his rosters. And he didn't give himself a real opportunity or his players an opportunity to take the game when they had the opportunity. Yeah, well, I mean, th you can go either way with that because, like I said, I, you you have to feel like this team ran out of gas. But if you didn't feel like he had the horses on the bench that were going to give him the requisite help he needed, then you had to do just that. I mean, Brandon Jennings has not really done much for them this entire series. Baldanovich played well and played well in spurts um, throughout the series as well, too. He's 16 minutes. I guess you might have wanted to see them play a little bit. And this is hard to hard to qualify because I feel like, Gortat should have the edge on the glass, you know, against the Boston Celtics out there. And he did well. He had four offensive rebounds, seven defenses, 11 total. Um, but maybe it was the time to maybe play a little bit ball, small ball five with Markeef, or maybe bring a guy like Jason, Jason Smith out there to try to sweep space of four and maybe even combat a little bit what Olenek was doing. You know, because remember, what game was that? Was that game two? I think Olenek got off really hot in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the was it maybe that game one. He got off, he got hot because he was posting up Oubre and things of that nature, and they had to make, yeah, it was game one, and they had to make a switch, and I brought Jason Smith out there. So maybe you say, okay, he could have did some of those little tweaks here, but hindsight is 20-20 at this point, and you're right. He went with his guns, so I'm not going to fault him. I have the utmost respect for this Wizard team. We're obviously going to talk about them a little bit later on as well, too. You know, I, and kind of and listen, I, I think the other thing that you have to look at as well, too, is this is also setting a tone, Shaw. You know, Scott Brooks is going to be the head coach for the Washington Wizards for the next few years. If you're Bradley Beal and you're John Wall, you have already been through how many head coaches in the last six or seven years now? They've been through like three head coaches leading up to Scott Brooks. At some point, management is going to have to feel like they, ha they have their man. And I think Scott Brooks allowing Beal and allowing Wall to play for as long and as hard as they could to give themselves a chance to try and win this basketball game says more about the relationship and that he can continue to build with these guys if they're going to be the future for the Washington Wizards. I mean, this is exactly what you want to see from a head coach is that... All right, all right, all right man. You're, you're giving them too much. You, am you got, I, am I giving them too much? Got, because we're going we're gonna to wrap up the Wizards in a little bit, man. We, 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 you're giving them too much right now. We got we to gotta save that for how the Wizards can move forward because I think if you're talking about Scott Brooks, he's definitely got to be a part of their future and, 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 and the decision-making process of what they're going to do when we get to that part man we got we got we got we got to move it on come on <sighs> all right all right damn it all right so let's go ahead and move it on all right let's go ahead and right get into the breakdown let's talk about the cleveland cavaliers taking on the boston celtics or you know maybe we should say the boston celtics taking on the cleveland cavaliers usually you save it for you know the home team the best team uh but the celtics are the number one seed 
Why right. is it though, Shaw, that as much as we're giving credence to the fact that number one seeds usually means you're, you're the best team of that conference, that nobody is giving the Boston Celtics any kind of shot whatsoever to knock off King James, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Love, and the rest of that, that crew that runs things out there in the land? Well, as I just tweeted a little while ago, I, I think the Spurs and Celtics are, you know, kind of hand in hand singing kumbaya with each other as the two most dis disrespected teams to ever make a conference finals. Like, like nobody's given either one of those teams any chance in hell in order in, in, in getting past them. And again, you know, it, it's hard when, you know, LeBron is the really, you know, pun intended, the reigning king of the Eastern Conference. And we've had our conversations about how and who would dethrone them. Uh, this Celtics team is, is more than edgy. Uh, they they have a, a massive chip on their shoulders, and they've already heard all the conversations about how they shouldn't be here, um, how they're going to get rocked out in, in, in the conference finals if they even got past Washington, all of that stuff. Um, and I think they're going to obviously be right there to give them all the hell they can handle. Uh, but this Boston team, again, it really is is unfortunate that even to even to some degree myself, like just don't respect them enough uh, because you look at them on paper and you're just like, how, Sway? Like, how? But they get it done with an amazing coach um, and a guy who is definitely becoming one of the best players in the NBA if he's not already one of the best players in the NBA, and Isaiah Thomas. And one thing that I'll say for sure has been true, I think Al Horford is up to shooting 58% in the playoffs. We said from the very beginning, like, you weren't going to feel his impact in the regular season. It was for the moments that are, are happening here in the playoffs. And everybody is, is stepping up right now. Yes, it took them seven games to get past a tough, tough Washington Wizards team. Uh, but this is a Celtics team that nobody should sleep on anymore. And, you know, hey, we're going to talk about what happens with them um, in the draft lottery in, in a couple of days here and see how that works out, too. But I think them getting to the conference finals um, should be a huge sign yet again uh, for potential free agents um, that might be looking to, to change destinations and maybe see if they can get Boston over the hump if things don't go their way uh, the rest of the season. Now, so I want to go back to your point with regards to Al Hofford and how he is steadily on the upswing, right? He's on the uptick with regards to his gameplay, his efforts. Um, you know, he's he's been phenomenal uh, and, and is definitely, uh, you know, Jekyll and Hyde. You know, who he was in the regular season is definitely not what we're seeing right now uh, through the stretch of the playoffs. And, and though he had somewhat of a pedestrian type of performance in this game seven against the Washington Wizards, I'm curious about what side of the ball Al Hofford's presence is going to mean to the Boston Celtics against the Cleveland Cavaliers, because you can make the argument that they're going to need him for the offense. OK, uh, but at the same time, I tend to feel like given the way that the Cleveland Cavaliers stack up from a size perspective, could it be that this is an opportunity for Al Hofford defensively to be a mechanism that can thwart what the Cleveland Cavaliers have been so successful doing against the Boston Celtics over the course of the last three seasons? Well, I think that's an interesting question because it, it has to be both. Um, but I feel like he, he does now have enough foot speed to stay with a guy like Kevin Love um, in certain lineups. And I'm not really worried about Tristan Thompson running by him or doing much with that either. Um, if, he, if they're running out there and, and Horford match up against a guy like Love, I think he has enough foot speed to stay with him. I don't think Love's going to drive by him and cause problems, kind of in the way Markeith did at times um, in the series against the Washington Wizards. So it, it's definitely going to be both. But because it's what you got to remember with Horford, it's not just about his scoring. And you know, I'll go again. We talked about him shooting fifty-eight percent. I mean, Shaw, he only he only he's only scored nine points per game in the matchups against the Cleveland Cavaliers uh, this in the regular season. So something is something has got to give. Uh, and, and and you know, I, I didn't mean to cut that off to to to. to you know, demoralize the, the point that I'm thinking that you're trying to make. But I would think, though, at some particular point, you know, how we talk about sometimes guys best uh, guys offensively is their best defense against certain matchups. And I feel like if none of these guys uh, for the Boston Celtics, Al Hawford, Amir Johnson, if none of these guys get any of the the Cleveland Cavalier bigs in some form of foul trouble, they're not giving themselves any chance or opportunity to really play the kind of defense that I think is going to put pressure on the Cleveland Cavaliers who just offensively, I think they're just too good. Right. Right. Well, I mean, it also depends on how they decide to match up. So I think if, if, if Horford, I think will be matched up with love for the most part in most sets defensively, but I don't know for sure if that will be the same. They may try to go Tristan on Horford, um, you know, for the most part when, when the game has started out, like, so, so that's going to be very interesting to see. And then also to see if, you know, and when you start games, does Brad Stevens continue with the Amir Johnson thing? I think he does. Amir only, you know, is going to play eight minutes, ten minutes, whatever it is, and then get out, and they're going to pretty much play small ball after that. 
Um, but it will be interesting to see like what what Horford is able to do because if he gets love on him, then there's a possibility he can at least try to go in the post, right? He's not going to boss up Tristan Thompson down there, but he might try to do it against Love and maybe get Love in foul trouble, which would be obviously extremely beneficial to Boston. So I just don't think Ty Lue is going to play that card. I just don't see that that being the case. Horford's game is really to kind of be on the perimeter, pick and pop, shoot the open three when he has it, and really facilitate some offense, you know, kind of off the ball for guys that are cutting in and, on, and coming off screens as well, too. And that's where his offense is going to play a big point. But to your original question, you know, it's going to be both sides that he has to play basketball on and really be effective in, and make an impact. And I think he really does have to do a great job kind of slowing down Kemba and make sure he doesn't get off. You're tuned to the baseline. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA previewing the Boston Celtics and Cleveland Cavaliers in the Eastern Conference Finals, the two best teams in the East, head-to-head. It's all for the marbles to make their way to the NBA Finals. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the back, the backcourt matchups because that, to me, is obviously going to be the most intriguing. And then we'll get into the King and LeBron and you know what the Celtics are going to have to pray and do uh, to to be able to stop you know the, the 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 almighty one the messiah right so but this backcourt matchup is an intriguing matchup I mean everybody has been kind of you know they always they they always look at Kyrie Irving the guy's a sharpshooter the guy hits in the clutch um, they they always seem to come down on him about his defense but we've seen in 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 numerous moments that you know he plays. Uh, quality defense uh, you know he, he he showed it in the game seven in the uh in the in the nba finals last season and i feel like this is a matchup where isaiah thomas's speed should certainly give a guy like kyrie irving fits if kyrie does have to wind up playing him albeit i think it's going to wind up being a collaborative effort between shumford and jr smith and they're going to try and put somebody bigger on him obviously but you have to think that at some particular point um avery bradley he, he's got to be that guy. I'm assuming Avery Bradley is going to be the one that's going to be Ding up against Kyrie Irving. How important is Avery Bradley's defense going to be against Irving? Well, it's going to be immense, you know, because what you, and, and I'm not, I'm not ducking your question here, but I kind of wonder what the Cavs will try to do. I mean, you feel like, okay, well, they've swept two teams. They're in the Eastern conference finals. They're the defending NBA champions. They're not going to do a whole lot to change, you know, their, their, their offense and their schemes per se. But you wonder if, they look at what Washington did a little bit by allowing people to post up Isaiah, no matter who it was, and just going in and throwing that confidence out there. You wonder what, how that's going to play and how, if they're going to have to try to, the Celtics, I mean, try to have to hide Isaiah some. I think Avery Bradley obviously becomes the key there, um, trying to disrupt their offense because, again, that one three pick and roll with Kyrie and LeBron, is, it, it's absurd. So it really is going to be about how they play that. Does Avery get over that screen? Does he go under that screen? You can't go under and let Kyrie shoot the three. So you got to go over, or the hedge man, um, whoever that is guarding LeBron in, in that mo- in that space and time, has to make sure that they have an, uh, they stay connected to Kyrie and then have enough time to get back to Braun if if that's so the case. Because then you can't have Braun matched up against Avery Bradley on the switch. So, like again, that is a huge problem for for Cleveland. But if it's just, I mean, for Boston. But if it's just straight one on one defense, uh, AB has got to be up in Kyrie's. Like he's got to be right in his seat, man. Just can't lose track of him at all because you know he can finish with either hand. He's got that sick lefty floater going over the last couple of seasons now. Can shoot the three, can shoot the step back, can do everything he needs to do. Uh, AB's defense is going to be immense. All right, so we've seen the Boston Celtics just launch the three ball. I feel like you know they channeled their their inner rocket and and decided to just you know go three happy crazy right. And and this is this is who they are. Brad Stevens is 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 embraced it. And he's like, you guys want to let it fly, then let it fly. They certainly let it fly in the game seven against the Washington Wizards. And my expectation is, is that they're going to try and let it fly against the Cleveland Cavaliers. With that being said, Shaw, Cleveland Cavaliers are not shy about shooting that three ball either. So who's, who, whose propensity to shoot the three is most important, is most needed? To me, Boston. Well, <laughs> well, Boston. well I, and, I, and I, would, I would definitely say I agree with you. But I think that if the Boston Celtics... Like, I feel like with the Boston Celtics, they have to pick and choose their battles about how they go about shooting shooting that three ball. Because if you're the Cleveland Cavaliers, this has been who you are. I feel like the Boston Celtics still are, have come into their own about this, right? Like, maybe this Washington Wizards series has given them confidence to do it. But now you're talking about doing it against a team that knows how to do it, right? Does it better than anybody else really in the Eastern Conference. So if you can't get away with shooting 26%, 20%, launching half as many threes as, as the amount of two-point shots that you normally get, then don't put yourself on the free throw line. Because like to me, what I saw tonight, Shaw, 
was a perfect opportunity where when their three ball wasn't working, they were still working fouls and getting to the to the foul line. I mean, the Celtics had more fouls against, you know, in in in, in this game than the than the received more fouls than the Washington Wizards. So they were on the free throw line and they were shooting free throws. My whole problem is, is that if you're the Boston Celtics and you just jump, you know, launch threes, but then you don't get anyone in foul trouble, you give yourself no opportunity when you're cold shooting to at least attain points to stay in a game when the Cleveland Cavaliers can prove that they can be the type of team that can just be completely hot shooting from three and can nearly be unstoppable. Well, I mean, yeah, that's my point. Like, it means more to Boston to be able to knock down their threes on a regular basis. Otherwise, this will not be a very long series. Um, they're going to have to get hot from the outside. But then you don't believe that. But then you're saying that you want them to shoot that three then and rather I, than, that's than showing game. balance. I, I can't see how they're going to change that. I mean, yeah. we said that even going into game seven versus the Wizards. Like, we know they're going to shoot the three. Like, that's what they do. They're not going to change that all of a sudden now and become this, you know, mid-range level team or are getting a whole bunch of penetration, getting all their points in the paint. Like, it's just not who they are. And, and they can't all of a sudden become that. Um, in, 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 in the conference finals. I mean, it would take, a, a, as you keep saying, Herculean transformation for something, that, for something like that to happen. So if their three ball isn't falling, then this is done. You know, like there's no chance at all. I will give Boston credit, and I'm going to give them a backhanded compliment here. Currently, as we recorded, your, they were your, your backhanded compliments, though, sometimes can leave a sting. So just, <laughs> just be gentle. They just won game right. seven, bro. Just be gentle. All right. Well, I mean, they are the second best team in the playoffs and the first best team currently in the that are still in the playoffs in defending the three themselves. But they also played Chicago and Washington. So <laughs> so those aren't <laughs> those aren't two yeah. prolifically shooting three point teams. And then here you come to Cleveland Cavaliers, who again are, are one of the best at doing it, right up there with the Celtics and, and, and the Golden State Warriors, obviously. So to me, with the space and the openness that LeBron creates, you know, with his play um, and getting guys like Kyle Corver to step into shots. Obviously, we talked about Kyrie, Kevin Love, all that. Uh, that is just a unique challenge for, 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 for the Boston Celtics. And don't have the stats in front of me. Don't know how they defended the three against Cleveland um, in the regular season, uh, per se. But that is something that they, they have to shoot the three well, and they're going to have to defend the three well if they have any chance. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about the X-Factor players, Shaw. If you are the Cleveland Cavaliers, who is the X factor, who needs to step up and 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 really you know hold it down, and and for the Boston Celtics, who do you have as your X factor? I mean, that's hard for me to answer with Cleveland. Like, I I don't think there is an X factor. This one guy who so, that's a little arrogant. Like, well, they're just so damn good. I just like there's really no they're they're not X. I mean, they're more like O's. Like, yeah. but I mean, but that's, I mean, and that's where we're at though. At this point, it's it's. Unless we, this series goes extremely deep and it becomes a game seven, then we have that conversation. It's like, okay, well, this guy's going to be the guy that really steps up. I think you have to give them the, the benefit of the doubt, understanding that, listen, they're a very good basketball team. They get it done with their starters and their bench comes in and contributes in an acceptable enough manner. Um, I don't know that there's an X factor per se that's really going to make the, all the difference for them um, outside of you know their, their, their top guys. Now, for Boston, it's a lot like how, how I said um, – you know, talking about in 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 the, in the Western Conference series, it's like I think it's 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 a collective, if you will, for for the Celtics. Yeah, you can look at Avery Bradley. Yeah, you can look at Al Horford, but Stevens is not going to Scott Brooks the Boston Celtics. We we said we said that we've seen it. We know it to be true, right? Olenek, <laughs> Marcus Smart, those guys are going to play, and some combination of Jalen Brown and Terry Rozier will maybe also get some spot minutes in there as well too. It's the, it's the Celtics bench that is the absolute X factor in this. And again, not to say that Olenek needs to score 26 points in 28 minutes ever again. It would be nice, obviously, if you're the Boston Celtics. Look, if Kelly but, Olenek <laughs> replicates that. <laughs> well, I mean, like, but I'm saying, you know, like it, it, it needs to be some level of consistency with their bench. It, it may, it may have meant that Avery Bradley fell off, fell, you know, fell off somewhere, like, in, it, you know, off the, I, uh, on the bike, off the bike, you know. Somewhere, so something must have happened to Avery Bradley. If but to me, that's rely that's on the, Kelly Olynyk. That's the thing that matters the most for Boston is being able to make sure that there is not a significant drop off when those starters go on the bench and guys like Smart and Olynyk get into the game. Um, for me, that's huge. And and if you if I were to point out one starter, Jay Carter, I think has to have a has to have a great series on both sides of the basketball as well too. The Celtics again, they do it as a collective. They have to do it together. Otherwise, they have no chance. Well, so, listen, it, it, to me, um. Well, the Cleveland Cavaliers, I think that the X factor is going to be J.R. Smith. Um, 
he he needs to find himself. I, I'm not quite certain what's going on with him. Uh, and I don't know where he is with, say, with Tyron Lue. I've just seen that, like, there have been moments and times where J.R. Smith has just been, like, erratic. He had, I don't know if he, he like, you know what I'm saying? If, if, uh, if he got, he got touched by Draymond Green or something, but like is he he's just an emotional roller coaster, and uh, this is the kind of game where he could really use the opportunities and the matchups to really help this Cavaliers team put the, a team like the Celtics away. Uh, he's someone that's going to spread the floor. He's someone that's going to cause havoc, um, and he's going to be someone that can really help James LeBron James off you know off the ball, uh, especially and and Kyrie Irving as well too. So I think J.R. J. Smith to me is a is is a key player because they're but getting isn't it, they're getting isn't it they're the getting same ex- thing with them though like in terms of like that trio where it needs to be J.R. Shumpert and Kyle Korver like LeBron has said as much as but that I, too, I'm more, of, but that's that my shooting thing. guard Kyle, position is like a it's a rotation it's, it's, it's a, a rotation no but I, what I'm saying is is that Kyle Korver to me I, I think he's been doing great I, I, Kyle Korver in many instances throughout the playoffs where I thought that he would be somewhat of a liability. Right. Like he's actually come in and he, he seems like he really fits with what they're trying to do. And I think Tyron Lue is playing more Kyle Korver than I think he would like to play with J.R. Smith, which, again, it just lends to the idea that if you want to use this rotation, he, he would clearly would love to rely more on the guys that helped him, you know, win this championship. But I think that, you know, he, he still sees that Smith is struggling. So, I you know, and I'm not saying this because this has to do with the finals. I'm just saying that when you look at the matchups of the Boston Celtics, the Celtics do have a plethora of players that they can throw at LeBron James with, that they're going to try to do that when they're changing the rotations in the lineup. So it's going to come down to that shooting guard position where there's a lot more versatility. I don't think Lou is going to rely on Richard Jefferson the same way that he would like to rely on Iman Shumpert, J.R. Smith, and Kyle Korver. I think he wants to really lean on those dudes but to do that smith is just you know he's just got to wake up you know i think everyone else is going to do their part but i just think that if you're looking at somebody to me that can really supplement the dominance of why the cleveland cavaliers should be or you know should walk through this this finals it's because of the fact that you're getting the compliment you're getting contributions from the guys that really have not done anything through the course of the first two playoff series that the Cleveland Cavaliers have played. So, I mean, that's me, and I could be wrong, but I'm certainly not going to lean on Derek Williams or Darren Williams or any of those dudes. You know, that if Tyron Lue has to go in the, deep in that bag to pull something out, then something must be happening on Boston Celtics' side that's causing him to have to rethink this whole situation. I think that's, you know, a very interesting assessment. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's funny for me, though, with, with the Cavaliers is, you know, I often wonder, and I've said this for a very long time, is like, do you just... Do you just let LeBron kind of go crazy, you know, and 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 score 45, 50 points and just try to take away everything else? I mean, I, I often wonder that. I know it's hard because you're going to try to help. You, your instinct is to help if he's driving the lane and getting past his defender. I mean, that's what leaves, you know, one of those guys open out for an open jump shot, if you will. But, I mean, you have to be a little bit more disciplined. You can't leave Kyrie, and obviously you can't leave Kevin Love if he's out there as well, too. I think if you try to stay home with those guys and maybe help off with one of the other two guys and, and just maybe you just force him to be a, a, an ultimate scorer, I've always thought that was probably your best strategy. And there's no strategy that I think is a perfect one. I um, mean, people have beaten this one as well, too. But if I'm Boston, I just don't want Kyrie and Kevin Love hooting and hollering and shooting threes and Kyle Korver coming in for 10 minutes and knocking down four threes. Like, I don't want to see that. You know, I'd rather like, hey, LeBron beat us like how he did X amount of years ago um, in, in that game six game. Uh, you know, when he was with the Miami Heat and just like he was just was just superior dom- dominant. Like, I feel like that's what Boston should would and should have to do. It's like, hey, Bron, go score 40, 50 points a game if you're going to win this series. I, I don't disagree with you. I, I feel like when I look at how this Boston Celtics team is structured, you know, you're going to have to pick your poison. But you can't let all three of these guys get off. I mean, both LeBron James is averaging close to 30 points a game in the matchups against the Celtics in this series. In, in in the regular season. Kyrie Irving, 25. Kevin Love, 23. You're not going to win if these guys are averaging plus 20 points per game um, in, in this in this series. Uh, because it, the magnitude of this is also, you know, it, it's kind of like triple. It's kind of like they're scoring 60 points between each of them when you're talking about the Eastern Conference Finals. 29 points is a lot of points to allow a guy of someone like LeBron James to, to, to do. I, I mean, you know, we talk about the 55 point, you know, 
uh, dominance against, uh, you know, the Boston Celtics, who at that time was arguably the best team defensively in the NBA. And he just absolutely, he absolutely shredded them. But I think what again, but what hurt them, <laughs> what, but, what, but what hurt them the most is they didn't stay disciplined even through the dominance. And then they allowed other guys to really dictate the feel and the tone that they, they had no answer for him or the team. It's one thing when you say you have no answer for him, but you should have an answer for the team. So I agree with you to that level. If you're the Boston Celtics, um, you really can't allow guys like Kyrie Irving, Kevin Love, Tristan Thompson, you know, giving you, you know, um, multiple efforts because the guy's an offensive rebounding machine. All of the little things that, that are going to minimize the Celtics' opportunity to stay in games or to take over games, they have got to, to cut them at the knees. And ultimately put it on LeBron James to be something more than what I where I think he's really settled in being. He he really is confident and relies that he can get his guys involved and get them in the games whenever he wants to. Um, and if you're the Celtics, you you really may have to live with the idea of you need to take this game, you need to dominate this game. You run through us, and we will we bow before you. We will hand you the the keys to the city, LeBron. You own Boston. And and I think maybe Boston Celtics fans they want to they don't want to hear that, but you may have to live with that if this, the greater goal is for them to get to an NBA Finals because that's really ultimately you just can't have these three guys averaging twenty plus points per game in the series. If this happens, they're not winning it. It's simple as that. They're just not well, winning it. I mean, and I guess here's a question that you know maybe not a question but an observation. Looking at the statistics, right? Cleveland. Only has three guys averaging 10 plus points per game so far in the playoffs. I've only played eight games, obviously, right? But Kevin Love is only at 13.8. You know, Kyrie's at 23.8. LeBron is obviously been stellar at 34.4. But, you know, hey, Love has been kept in check. You don't want to get see him get off. You want to see him kind of, and again, I think LeBron has been doing it, but he's been also getting nine rebounds and seven assists and things of that nature. Tristan Thompson is averaging 4.9 offensive rebounds a game in the eight games that they played in the playoffs. Like all that stuff, those those are little things. You got to have fill those little holes um, if you're really going to have a chance too. So if you can keep LeBron and maybe have him up his points per game to 39, 41-ish per se, uh, keep Love kind of where he's at, I, I feel like that really is their best chance as, as we just alluded to. So, you know, um, you know, I think it's going to be a great series, man. I guess it's time to get into some predictions. Um, but, you know, lots of lots of juicy tidbits when you talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Boston Celtics. But I'm going to hit it off with you, man. Who you got, man? How many games and, and you know, who's going to take it? Listen, I, I applaud the Boston Celtics for getting, you know, getting this far. I, I felt like if they got past the Chicago Bulls, that, that they would put themselves in a position to play in the Eastern Conference Finals. So regardless of what I predicted, you know, them doing this in seven and things, I, I just felt like, you know, if this team did what they needed to do, they'd be they'd be in the finals. That being said, this team just is still not constructed in a way that they can run with the kind of combination that the Cleveland Cavaliers have. You look, LeBron James, Kyrie Irving, and Kevin Love. Uh, you know that that's three uh, top twenty-five players. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I I go by the rule of thumb in cross country because I used to run cross country. You know, when, when I was in high school. Okay, you win by place so the lower the placement the the less the points the you know the better you win and and when i look at i look at it rankings <laughs> the celtics have isaiah thomas who are who who arguably catapulted himself into this conversation of being a top 20 nba player through this year that doesn't mean that he's got a bunch of guys trailing behind him doing the same thing and so you just look at it if the Cleveland Cavaliers, who have been down this road and know what to do, where to make the adjustments, they have a chip. <laughs> you know, if you had asked me if I had one more other player who has some veteran savvy, championship caliber in them, could help sway the difference in this series. I just don't see it happening. Although I do not see the Cleveland Cavaliers sweeping the Boston Celtics like they've done in in in, uh, in previous years. I think the Cavaliers take it in six. But it's not without saying that the Boston Celtics have shown me a hell of a lot more than what I could ever imagine for, even making me come a little bit down off of my criticism of Danny Ainge and what he didn't do. Um, to see the effort that I've seen from these guys up to this point in the playoffs has been immaculate. I just think that they're moving against an immovable force against the Cavs, so they take it in six. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to really go against something like that, um, especially with the praise and all the things that LeBron has done. 
throughout his career, and especially even this year, 14th year, and now really still being one of the best players in the NBA. Like, that's absurd to me. Um, I definitely think the Cavaliers are going to get past Boston, um, and it's not going to be a gentleman sweep. Um, although, I mean, that seems could be very, very likely. But here, we here on this program, uh, the Celtics have definitely gained our respect even more so um, by by result of how them uh, how they matriculated through the playoffs, down 0-2 versus Chicago Bulls. You know, Isaiah Thomas going through that tough thing with his sister, obviously coming back and winning four straight there. Um, Wizards, for the most part, really had some the better statistics for a majority part of the series. They still find a way to win that. Um, I think the Celtics still find a way somehow. I don't know what it will be, who it will be, and how they'll do it. Um, but I think they will at least get two games as well um, and, and, and lose and bow out in six on Cleveland's home court. Uh, but again, again, you're not taking anything away from the Cleveland, I mean, from the Boston Celtics. Um, it's just, I feel like this, again, they're, this is just the best team in the Eastern Conference and has been for a very long time. All right. Well, there you have it. We both believe that the Cleveland Cavaliers will be representing the East in the NBA Finals. It's still going to be a heck of a matchup. Boston Celtics fans, be proud, uh, but also be ready. They're going to need every ounce of momentum, uh, every ounce of support uh, to be able to push this Cleveland Cavaliers team, who I know is feeling pretty confident right about now with the way that they have swept the first two teams that they've played against. But let's give the Boston Celtics a lot of credit. They show a lot of heart, and they definitely are going to be a tough, tough team to deal with. And hopefully they will make this a competitive series that we know that the Boston Celtics, with their mindset and their mantra, is capable of. Kelly O'Clinic. Running, running, run, running, running for the running for candidacy. Kelly O'Clinic, book it. He gonna make some, he gonna make some noise again in 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 in, in the uh, Eastern Conference Finals. <laughs> What's up, Ko, the Canadian can candidate? I like it. Let's go with it. Let's run with it. You're tuned to the baseline. Kelly Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA, and this was the breakdown. <laughs> Time now for the drop. Kelly Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast and. Before I was uh, before I was ushered into our conversations of doing the preview, uh, Shaw and I alluded to, you know, we had to, we, it was unfortunate that we needed to do this, you know, at that time. It's time for us to hitch that wagon for the Washington Wizards, man. Go on, get. Um, listen, man, heck of a season by the Washington Wizards. Uh, no one expected this basketball team uh, to be a second place team in the Southeast Division. No one expected them. Uh, to win <laughs> in the playoffs. Uh, I don't even think anybody expected them to be an above 500 basketball team, Shaw. And yeah. to find themselves basically one game away uh, to give themselves a chance to play in the Eastern Conference Finals, you know, albeit another disappointing loss, uh, you know, that you have to notch in John Wall's book. You still have to say, man, excellent effort and excellent job, you know, by this basketball team, and especially for first-year head coach, uh, Scott Brooks, man, Th these guys, they are going to be a threat uh, in the next few years. I mean, <laughs> this is this is the kind of continuity that you don't like to see from dominant basketball, you know, from a, for, for basketball teams that have been in control for a few years, because there is just un untapped potential when we talk about the Washington Wizards. True. And, you know, when we were in our, our, our intro there, we were talking a little bit about the importance of, of Scott Brooks, right? and what he's done to this team, to this roster. And I remember you saying way, way back, and, you know, I heard you, and I was like, all right, well, we'll see if that comes to fruition. And not really, you know, giving it a whole lot of thought outside of that, I was like, you know, Cal's got some great theories, and I don't know if this is going to be one of them, but this was true. You know, Otto Porter played extremely well under under the tutelage of Scott Brooks, extremely and he, well. And he was, he was, he played big time. He, listen, game five, I'm sorry, game six, the guy didn't score any points, only had seven rebounds. OK, in game six and the Washington Wizards still found a way to win that basketball game in this game in game seven against the Boston Celtics. He basically was one of the reasons why the Washington Wizards had that lead going midway into the third quarter. I mean, he basically he was a completely different player. And if you can tell me that there's something in him that's going to be exactly why they drafted this guy in the first round a few years ago. And it's because Scott Brooks is is tapping into something that we're finally seeing why this guy was a lot was like a lottery pick as a draft pick, then I'm all for that because this guy has got great game and is is still young. You know, it's like 23. He's and he's definitely coming into his own. And yeah. 
Um, but that contract is up there, boy. So, <laughs> oh, um, oh, lots man. of lots of circulation throughout the season, especially when he was leading the league in three point shooting. You know, okay, well, is he now going to have to end up getting a max contract? And um, I, I think again, remember the max is the one it used to be. Um, it's not it doesn't have the same connotation for everybody. Uh, but I think the Wizards are probably going to have to max him out or, or risk losing him um, to definitely you know the highest bidder. Um, they're not going to be. So able now to the question becomes to your point, Shaw. The question becomes is. Even with what uh, Otto Porter provided you with, are you more confident with him moving yeah. forward, um, or do you make moves, you know, elsewhere to supplement that three position? No, nah, I'm riding with Otto, you know, and I think you want to keep um, a team of this magnitude that really seems to be hitting their stride and coming into their own. You want to keep them together. Bill's only 23 years old. Wall's only going to 26, and Otto Porter, as I just said, is 23. You want to keep that. You want to keep that grind. Even Marquis Morris, 27 years old. These these guys are are going to be a problem. They obviously they just need to clean up that bench and get, get some more help there. I think the biggest question is whether or not they're going to re-sign Bogdanovich and bring him back into the fold. Uh, I don't think Jennings will be back. You know, Trey Burke will not be back. Trey Burke may be out of the oh, NBA. Oh, I got something to ask you about this thing with Jennings Shaw. How mm-hmm. bad of a, how bad of a hit um, is this for Brandon Jennings? Um, do you even see him? Brandon Jennings ruined my reputation. You know, remember we we talked about the beginning. Little, you, sound about, little, you sound a little salty right now, man. We talk do we need to get do we need to, do we need to get Salt Bay to spread something on on Brandon Jennings right now? We need to get Salt I Bay mean, to spread something on, on Brandon. I really I really wanted him to play well at Washington, but remember we talked about Brandon Knight and Brandon Jennings potentially being six man of the year candidates, and we were way off on both of those so on those off. predictions. You know what I mean? So like that didn't come to fruition at all, and then. All right, he would have been a perfect backup behind Eric Rose. All right, didn't work out in here. Oh, this is the you're gonna be the perfect backup behind John Wall. Negative. Uh-uh. So you, you know, know what really really disturbed me about Brandon Jennings, and and we could just look to this game. Uh, it, it's almost as if Brandon Jennings was in his own little world, and maybe that this is something that you have to look at with Scott Brooks now as 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 something that he's gonna need to improve upon. Is while he doesn't have absolute control over the personnel that he would probably like to get in his system and, you know, from starters to bench, he's got to figure out a way to tap into some of these guys. Because the one thing about Brandon Jennings that could probably be a great thing for him but is also really a detriment to him is that he's a wild card. You know, he he, he goes off the cuff, you know, and this was a situation where the Wizards had ball movement. They were moving the basketball, but when – Get, Jennings gets on the court. The ball stops with him. And you can't have that when you have a team that is in the playoffs that is basically, you know, you know, putting it on the home team on the floor. You got to come in there and spell that superstar, John Wall. And he's playing like he thinks he's John Wall, but is not doing anything to help his team. And, and I, I mean, to me, that is what hurts more than anything because now you're going to try and put him somewhere else, man. I don't know if anyone is going to be confident that he can play within a system before he just starts flipping out and doing his own thing. Yeah, I mean, you wonder, and I'm not going to make excuses for anybody, you wonder if he was really fully healthy all this year and if he's going to take that summer because sometimes it takes it to, they say coming off those types of injury it takes you two years to really fully get back. You know, he's still young. I mean, what is he, 27 years old or something like that? So, I mean, he still has a lot of basketball left, you would hope. Uh, within those legs so he can get with hopefully get with a great trainer and kind of find his way back i just don't think the wizards are going to take that chance on him so i think yeah you bring auto porter back give him whatever you know you got to give him to keep him keep him intact um but that's going to put you very very close if not over uh the the um the salary cap right so what can you really do to fill out this this roster the one thing though as we continue to say like you just wonder how much does winning now impact your perception? Because now you're starting to turn that corner into being a franchise. And it's with- a very quick corner because I think they were looking at this as a possible rebuilding scenario because they didn't know where Otto Porter was going to be in the flux. Markeith Morris has still got a lot to prove. And really the only standout of, 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 of a question mark because he's on the back end of his career, so to speak, is Marcin Gortat. The guy's 33 years old making 12 mil. So, you know. I completely agree with you, Shaw. I think that now that this team has won basketball games, and we could look at this the same way that we look at the Boston Celtics. The Celtics had a couple of veteran pieces, and then what they saw from Isaiah Thomas and the combination with him, Bradley, and Smart had to really change their dynamic of how quickly do we need to start throwing money out to bring pieces together to keep what these guys got going. Right, and so you just don't know what they would be able to do, but you would hope that 
getting as far as they did and playing the way they did um, and having what can now legitimately, again, be considered an elite backcourt, especially because Bradley Beal was healthy this season, um, who's not going to want to come alongside and play those two guys? Like, those guys, they're legit, man. They're, they, they, are, they are superstars. Um, and John Wall is an elite point guard at this point of his career right now. So I think it should open the eyes to maybe some free agents that they maybe didn't have the opportunity to get last summer, although this isn't an amazing uh, draft class. I mean, it's draft class, a free agent class. Uh, but they just need some pieces, right? Their starting lineup is pretty much set. They need some pieces to come in here and help them off the bench. And I think there's plenty of guys coming up, coming off the bench this year uh, that will be available in free agents. You think about like Tony Snells and, and things of that nature. Like those are the type of pieces that they'll be able to fit in and fit in very nicely um, if you know they can get the contracts negotiated. Uh, but I'm very, very happy with this Washington Wizards team and what they're able to accomplish. Again, like I said, um, we just didn't think that they would get this far to begin the year. And then you started to see the signs of them turning it around. And that and once that train got going, it was really impossible to slow it down. They just got to figure out, again, to get that bench better and to find a way to win better on the road, especially in the playoffs. Where's your confidence level, though, with Markeith Morris and Marcin Gortat? You know, these guys have taken um, a lot of scrutiny. A lot of people still don't buy into Markeith Morris as, as, you know, as a legitimate power forward. I think that, you know, he certainly has improved. Um, I still think that he's fallen short of what he was – was supposed to give you since coming over from Phoenix. Uh, but, uh, you know, do you think that there needs to be a change there at the power forward center position, or do you ride with these two guys given the dynamic of what Bradley Beal and John Wall does for those guys? And Keith seems to be fitting in nicely with what, with as, as a nice compliment. I mean, if they could get a guy like Kevin Love or something like that, you know, maybe that might be, you know, whatever. I mean, you have to get a significant upgrade. Um, I don't think there is a whole lot available that is better for, 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 for their team and their roster and the way Scott Brooks wants to play right now than Keith. He's a tough guy. He's a physical guy. He can rebound the basketball. And we all know he, he can't be the number one option like how Phoenix was trying to make him out to be. That's not his role. This now, as a third, fourth option on that team, that's perfect for him. He's in the perfect situation. So I, I like Marquis for this roster, and I, do, I can't see them doing much to, to change that. Now, Gortat... As you alluded to, yeah, he's a little bit older at this point. You know, would he be better served coming off the bench? Um, I don't know. Do you think Yamahimi can really develop at this stage of his career? And I don't think that I, guy. But, you know, to your point, though, Shaw, I don't necessarily think that Marcin Gortat doesn't, does, isn't deserving to be a starter. I think, and if you're going to, if he's going to stay on this team, he should definitely start. But they definitely need a, a, a different look coming off of that center position. Um, and and it's, there's nothing wrong with doing what, like, the Warriors are doing, right? Like, I complain about Zaza Pachulia being a starter, but yet the guy's playing, what, like you said, like, what, about 12 minutes per game? And they're really rolling with the whole premise of putting Draymond Green out there and maybe at times playing Durant at the five with that lineup. But then they've got JaVale McGee. And JaVale McGee is, is completely away from what you get from Zaza Pachulia. David West, away from what you get from Jaja Pachulia. And those guys are rotating in that center position, you know, from time to time as well, too. So I think that to me is where I'm going at. If you're not going to upgrade and put money into a solidified starting five center who's going to eat up a ton of minutes for you at that position, then you got to get somebody behind him that is adequate enough that when you dispel him, he brings a different look, but is still efficient and effective for that position because all times too often we've seen that Marcin Gortat either disappears himself or that position disappears for the Washington Wizards and they get nothing from either, uh, from either end of the floor. True. You know, but I feel like Mahimi was supposed to be that guy had he been healthy. And, you know, whether that is... Well, he's getting paid or, like he was supposed to be that guy. Right. Yeah, and again, like I said, it's, it's whether that's truth or fallacy, I guess that still remains to be seen. But... I think that is the direction in which they were trying to go this year. Where and Mahimi had some nice moments, you know, playing in Indiana and things of that nature. Again, he's not a bad player, and he he can help you um, if healthy. And again, he's got a hefty, hefty contract, right? So I think that's what they're hoping for for the most part is that he can kind of come in and really be a more than a, a pseudo um, backup and rotation player, somebody who can really give them some plus minutes um, and spell Gortat if he gets into foul trouble or just doesn't have it on a particular a particular night. Um, but you do have to wonder just really how much does Porter's contract, if they assume they do keep him, how much that straps him from getting other free agents? Because does it, do you think the, the Wally veteran, like the next Joe Johnson, if you will, would, would he be willing to come there for a little less money, you know, to kind of be there like how Paul Pierce was a couple of years ago? Would he be willing to, would somebody be able to do that? 
you know, I feel like that that's a possibility, but just what does that fit and what does that look like for Washington moving forward? All right, Josh. So and the last question that I have for you is really in reference to Kelly Oubre and where the, where he goes from here as well, too, in relation to him uh, backing up Bradley Beal. You know, one of the things that you had said earlier before is that Bradley Beal was healthy this year, and I'm sure that they're going to do everything that's possible to replicate what they were able to do to keep him on this basketball court because the combination of him and Wall make them top five elite guards in the NBA. That being said, they got to get somebody to back up Wall and they got to get somebody to back up Beal, right? We talked about how Brandon Jennings is not going to cut it for these guys come next season. My question to you is Kelly Oubre. You know, this is a guy, again, profiled as a first-round draft pick but hasn't really lived up to those expectations. Now, he hasn't gotten a lot of opportunity. And here he had an opportunity to really kind of, you know, put himself in a position where he can earn the trust of Scott Brooks so he could really utilize him a heck of a lot more than what he, I think he attempted to do during the course of this year. But the guy's a loose cannon at times. He certainly needs to improve on a lot of things that Bradley Beal is able to do that he's still not able to do. How long do you continue to ride on the idea that Kelly Oubre can continue to ascend before you have to really start looking at other options, veteran-like type of options, given the immediate success now for the Washington Wizards? Yeah, I just don't think Oubre is really the backup at, at the two. I think he's playing more of the three and even sometimes a stretch four position. Um, but he's, he's, he's progressed definitely more so than last year. He, hit, he was able to add the corner three to his game this year, which is a huge step for him. You know, as a guy who really, you know, it's not really been able to shoot the basketball, um, you know, an athletic guy who can slash and things of that nature. I mean, really, he, his, his mentor should be Otto Porter, to be very honest with you. He should be, you know, kind of mimic his game after him and trying to be make sure he can be the best player he can be in, in that regard because I think that might be kind of his ceiling, if you will. I don't think Oubre is ever going to be an NBA all-star type of player, but definitely a guy who can have a very long career and be a, a more than a contributing member to a starting and championship level basketball team at some point. So I think he's 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 got a long way to go, um, but he's made some acceptable strides that I think we've started to see. And if he can just continue to build on that, he'll be just fine. I guess the question, like I said before, is just where else can they plug in and get help? Um, because they do need bench help pretty much everywhere. So that that's the biggest question for me. And, and un, unfortunately for them, there's no first round draft pick. So unless they're trading one of these guys, you know, or making some other move, um, you know, they're not going to be able to build through the draft this year. They have a second round pick, I believe somewhere in the fifties, um, but nothing in the first round. So it, it, there's no help coming um, in that way. And I guess you can always build and get somebody from the D league or Europe, whatever. I don't know if they have any European stashed away or whatever. Um, but They've just got to help this bench because the starting unit is one of the best in the NBA. You think John Wall will be an MVP candidate next year? Uh, yeah. I mean, he was he was an MVP candidate this year. I think he's going to get a lot of those those fifth-place votes, um, maybe over Isaiah Thomas, um, maybe over LeBron, who knows, depending on how, how people voted it. Um, so, yeah, he'll definitely be in the conversation next year and you know probably etches his way up into maybe that third – maybe two if it's, it's really, really special. Um, but I don't think he's going to be the MVP, but he's definitely going to be an MVP consideration for the next couple of seasons. All right, well, there you have it. The Washington Wizards, impressive season, one game away from finding themselves playing in the Eastern Conference Finals against the Cleveland Cavaliers, but fell short to the Boston Celtics. Unfortunately, it's that time for us to hitch their wagons and ride them out of playoff country. Washington Wizards going to have to go and get not without saying that they did have an impressive season nonetheless. Awesome show this week, Shaw. Oh, man. I mean, so much happening, man. And we got more shows to drop. But this Eastern Conference Finals, I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, you know, I know everybody hates when the prediction, uh, the outcome is already being laid out for them and stuff like that. But again, man, it's all about what happens in between the lines. And uh, these are two basketball teams that have completely different mindsets. One wants to establish dominance and one wants to make its name. And to do that, they're going to have to dethrone the King. And I think if you're the Boston Celtics, you really would not want to have it any other way. No, you wouldn't, you know, and the, you've gotten everything that you could have wanted out of the season. Realistically, at least in my opinion, you know, you've gotten to the Eastern Conference Finals, you had home court advantage, all those things have, have, have played your way. Um, and now to me, anything else is icing on the cake. So you're getting this experience now to play for, you know, to a chance to go to the NBA Finals uh, against the defending NBA champion. This is invaluable experience for, for Danny Ainge's Boston Celtics and Brad Stevens. Like, this is amazing for them. So they've gotten here. Al Horford, he hasn't even been here himself. I mean, well, sorry, he's been to the conference finals before. But 
again, with, not without a, a legitimate shot. Not without but, forgetting about it, you know, getting getting yeah, swept. They, get, they got worked out. You yeah. know, they got worked out, no doubt. And again, he's going to have some of those demons that he needs to exercise as well, too, to make sure that the Celtics don't get rolled on in, in this conference finals. But again, like I said, icing on the cake for Boston. Anything else right now is gravy. You just keep pushing. You keep working. You know, maybe luck, you know, f- you know, bounces your way and the miraculous happens. You get to the NBA finals. But either way, um, I think they put themselves in an amazing position free agent wise, draft lottery wise, um, and just as a, as a team chemistry building standpoint too, um, this team couldn't be in a better position than they are currently. That's definitely. Once again, we'd like to thank you and yours for listening to us here, the Baseline NBA podcast, as we continue to give our coverage and analysis throughout the NBA playoffs. Be sure to get at my man Shaw at Shaw Sports NBA or get at me at Game Face Lee, the show's Twitter handle at NBA Baseline. Available on all the major platforms on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Microsoft TuneIn, Player FM, iHeartRadio, also available on Roku and, and Google Music. To download any of these platforms, be sure to keep us locked in as uh, and allow us to be your go-to resource discussing all things in the association. Big shout-outs to our people, 16 Wins a Ring. Go to www.16winsaring to, to get the best in NBA content, written and audio-wise. You can also catch the Baseline NBA podcast on there as well, too. For the Baseline, Cali, Warren Shaw, keep us locked in throughout the finals because we will definitely be giving you the goods discussing all things happening in the NBA. Cali, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys. You know we do. And we'll catch up with you next time.